Hello to Reston and Restonites. I'm sorry I won't be able to meet you and to read to you personally on the date we had decided on, uh, but you know that whole story. I wanted to offer you some poems anyway. I unfortunately don't have anything that's really relevant to the moment we're living through right now. Uh, I've been completely unable to write and pretty much unable to read during this period. I feel like my brain is numb. Um, but I've chosen four poems which I think are kind of relevant and I'm going to read them to you and email them so that you can listen to this uh, this reading at any time. So the first poem I'm going to read, I'm reading because of people who are at home with young children and, and um, I think you will all appreciate this. This is a poem that's written as one long sentence. I'm going to read it that way. That was part of the challenge of writing it. It's called Bally High Calls Mama. As I was putting away the groceries I'd spent the morning buying for the week's meals I'd planned around things the baby could eat, things my husband would eat, and things I should eat because they aren't too fattening. Late on a Saturday afternoon, after flinging my coat on a chair and wiping the baby's nose while asking my husband what he'd fed it for lunch and whether the medicine I'd brought for him had made his cough improve, wiping the baby's nose again, checking its diaper, stepping over the baby who was reeling to and from the bottom kitchen drawer with pots, pans, and plastic cups, occasionally clutching the hem of my skirt and whining to be held. I was half listening for the phone, which never rings for me to ring for me, and someone's voice to say that I could forget about handing back my students' exams, which I'd had for a week, that I was right about the wasteland that I'd been given a raise, all the time wondering how my sister was doing, whatever happened to my old lover, and why my husband wanted a certain brand of toilet paper, and I wished I hadn't, but I bought another fashion magazine that promised to make me beautiful by Christmas, and there wasn't room for the creamed corn, and every time I opened the refrigerator door, the baby rushed to grab whatever was on the bottom shelf, which meant I constantly had to wrestle jars of its mushy food out of its sticky hands, and I stepped on the baby's hand, and the baby was screaming, and I dropped the bag of cake flour I'd bought to make cookies with and my husband rushed in to find out what was wrong because the baby was drowning out the sound of the touchdown although I had scooped it up and was holding it in my arms so its crying was inside my head like an echo in a barrel and I was running cold water on its hand while somewhere in the back of my mind wondering what to say about the wasteland and whether I could get away with putting broccoli in a meatloaf when suddenly through the window came the wild cry of geese. Poem number two is for elders who are experiencing this crisis in an especially frightening way, I think. Um, this poem is in a form which is called a golden shovel. The poem was invented re recently by a poet named um, Terence Hayes. The, the poem requires the end words of each line to be words quoted from a poem by Gr Gwendolyn Brooks. M my poem uses at it as its end words this line from Gwendolyn Brooks. It's three lines from Gwendolyn Brooks. Live not for battles won. Live not for the end of the song. Live 
in the along. My poem is called Bird Feeder. Approaching 75, she learns to live at last. She realizes she has not accomplished half of what she struggled for, that she surrendered too many battles and seldom celebrated those she won. Approaching 75, she learns to live without ambition, a calm lake face, not a train bound for success and glory. For the first time, she relaxes her hands on the controls, leans back to watch the coming end. Asked, she'd tell you her life is made out of the things she didn't do as much as the things she did do. Did she sing a love song? Approaching 75, she learns to live without wanting much more than the light in the catbird window seat, where, watching the voracious fist-sized tweets, she hums along. Again, the uh, Gwendolyn Brooks lines are, live not for battles won, live not for the end of the song, live in the along. And the last two poems I'll read are, in some ways, they're the same poem in different words. They're poems about mm, being alive on this miraculous planet. What a miracle it is to be alive in every moment. Every moment is something to give thanks for. So uh, these are two poems. The first one is called Crows, and it's it, I wrote it one year, a little while after Christmas when we had a lot of, I had a lot of leftover coconut macaroons, and I threw them out for the birds, and it struck me that the crows who ate them had probably never eaten coconut before. So this is again called crows. What if to taste and see, to notice things, to stand each is up against emptiness for a moment or an eternity? Images collected in consciousness like a tree alone on the horizon. Is the main reason we're on the planet. The foods here of the first crow to arrive, numbers two and three at a safe distance, then approaching the hand-created taste of leftover coconut macaroons, the instant sparks in the earth's awareness. And as I said, uh, these are two versions of the same poem. This poem is called A Gift to Be. Every millisecond pleads as I near the age my mother reached. In every plea, a seed of thanks from this speck of consciousness collecting memories, this moat of cosmic experience. Are we welcomed back or do we rain into a sea? What a gift to be, to wonder. So, this is Marilyn Nelson, and I am wishing you all a safe and surprisingly pleasant um, quarantine season. 
and good health to everyone and hope and don't fear and peace and love and celebration of every moment we share. Bye-bye.